Let us pray. Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. The text for our consideration this morning comes from Matthew chapter 22. We read the first 14 verses. And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Now the king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So far, God's holy word. Dear friends in Christ, before we get to the parable for this morning, I'd like to lay a question upon your hearts, and it's a question I'd really like you to think about. It's the world's most important question, and it's one I'll address by the end of this sermon. The question is this, and I really want you to think about it. If you were standing before God, on Judgment Day, and he looked at you and he said, why should I let you into heaven? What would your answer be? Think about that. Why should God let you into heaven? Give him one reason. What reason would that be? I just want that to simmer on your minds here, and we'll jump into our parable. In our parable this morning, Jesus describes heaven as a wedding feast. This is a pretty common description of heaven throughout Scripture. We saw it in our Old Testament reading where he described heaven as being a feast full of delicious meat and fine, well-aged wine. Elsewhere, Jesus describes his relationship with us, his church, as being a marriage. A marriage between the groom and his, and his bride, the church. I think the reason why oftentimes Jesus describes heaven as being a feast and our relationship as a marriage is because that's a pretty apt description of what heaven will probably be like. I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that might be the case. And what a wonderful description of heaven a wedding feast is then. A feast where we all gather together, enjoy one another's company, we celebrate a great happening, celebrate with wonderful food, all of our favorite things. Yeah, that might not be that far off from what heaven is like. As far as our marriage to Christ, as his bride, the church, that's a pretty great description as well. Ideally, if it wasn't a sinful world, ideally a marriage is where one person gives up of themselves to the other, where one person puts his or her interests second in line behind the others, and in love, sacrifices for the other person. That would be the ideal world. But that's exactly what Christ did in his marriage to us. Gave up of himself for our sakes, in love, put his own interests behind, and sacrificed himself for his church. Talk about love. So yes, a wedding, a wedding feast, these are actually really great descriptions of what heaven 
will be like. And just in general, thinking of heaven as a feast is a great illustration for us because we like food. We like to eat. Some of our happiest times on earth are around food, whether it be a potluck after church, or it be a, a meal on Christmas or Thanksgiving, or just dinner out with friends, or a date night with a significant other. Yeah, food generally makes us happy. And we know in heaven it's going to be the greatest, greater than all these things. And he describes it in such wonderful terms as he did in Isaiah. A, f- a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow. And he's giving all of this to us for free. He told us in our thematic verse, come without money, come and buy wine and milk. This is all ours for free. And that leads us to our theme for this morning. Who wouldn't want to attend this feast? It's really a rhetorical question. We don't have to answer it because, I mean, obviously the answer is no one. Everyone should want to attend this feast, the greatest feast ever thrown, an eternal feast for free. Yet sadly, as we look through our sermon text, we find that's just not the case. Sadly, there are many who don't really care about the heavenly feast that God has prepared. So we'll begin starting with verse 2. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. So it's very apparent from the beginning that the king, this is God the Father. The prince, this is Jesus, God the Son. And this king in the parable, God, he throws a feast for his son. He throws a feast and he invites all these people from the village And yet we run into some unexpected behavior. The people aren't interested. The people decide they won't go. Now, that's not too uncommon in our day and age. If you throw a wedding reception, you might invite a couple hundred people, maybe three quarters, maybe half of those people show up. A lot of people just can't go or maybe don't have the time to attend. In these days, however, it was quite a bit different. See, a king, when he's throwing a wedding feast, This is a big deal. Wedding feasts in general at those times, they weren't just a couple hours at a reception hall. They were were full week-long affairs with with great food the entire week long. And you think about a king throwing one of these wedding feasts. Talk about the best. A full week of the best food, the best wine, the best anything that money could buy. All provided for free by this king to his guests. This is really a a who's who event. And yet then, how strange it is that all these guests receive this invitation for this great feast. They say, no, I'm okay. Who wouldn't want to go to that feast? Yet sadly, many did not want to go. Looking at this historically, Jesus is speaking first and foremost about the Jewish people that he had come to and that the invitation was to initially. And yet, that was the response. No, we're fine, Lord. We don't need your heavenly feast. And then thinking about the work of the kingdom of God in our day and age, we see the same reaction time and time again. The Lord invites Sinners like us to his heavenly feast. And so many are just not interested in responding to the invitation. Picking up back at verse 4. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. We see the long suffering of this king. He's invited all these people and they've all refused every single one of them. But he doesn't stop there. He goes back. He re extends the invitation to them, hoping that they'll accept. In the same way, we see 
the Lord's gracious attitude towards sinners. How the Lord does not give up on people. The Lord continues to send his invitation out. Because God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, so he suffers long with people like us who are so stubborn and refusing to listen to his invitation. And he continues to go out and send that invitation to us. You see this gracious king, this gracious Lord, throwing this feast, giving us a second chance. Who wouldn't attend that feast? Well, again, we run into an unexpected answer. Verse 5. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Two pretty unbelievable responses to this invitation. In real life, this would never really happen. A king throws a feast and, and people decide, no, I would rather work hard on my farm all day than go to this, this week-long feast. Now, that wouldn't happen. Receiving the messengers who are carrying the guest invitation and taking them and killing them? No, that wouldn't really happen either. But these two dramatic responses show exactly the type of response that the Lord gets to the imitation of his word today. Looking at the second one first, we see many people throughout the world who are physically angry when they hear God's word, who throughout history have, have killed the messengers when they killed and martyred prophets and people who were sent. And still today, we see many people who become angry when we share God's word with them and will stop at nothing to try and find ways to persecute Christians. And that's one response to God's invitation. And thankfully, we don't find ourselves in that category. But what about the other one? The other response that's of people who go to their farm or to their business, paid no attention and went off. That doesn't sound too different from us a lot of times. Every time the Lord comes to us in his word, he's extending this invitation. He's saying, come to my feast that I'm throwing for you for free. And how often do we see these opportunities to gather around his word and we say, well, Lord, I'd, you know, I'd come to church today, but I'm awfully tired. I'd rather, I just need to get my rest today. And Lord, I know that we're gathering around your word this morning, but you know, football is only 16 weeks out of the year. I can't miss that. Or Lord, I know I could be studying your word right now, but I really just need to relax. I need to go about my own business at this moment. Whatever the excuse is, we fit into this category the people who respond to God's invitation with just general disinterest. After all, we go to church on Sunday, the rest of the week, that's for us, isn't it? That's often how we think, at least in my case. And what is God's response? The king responds in verse 7. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Is that an overreaction? The Lord responding in this way to the people that he's given chance after chance after chance to hear his word? I'm not sure it is an overreaction. Actually, that's exactly what each one of us deserve. So who does he invite now? Starting in verse 8. Then the king said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. So he said the first were unworthy. Unworthy because they had rejected the invitation and chosen not to go. So he has lost this entire group of people, so who does he have to send it out to? 
He's made this entire feast. He wants to fill the hall. He sends his servants out to the countryside, to the streets, to find anyone they come across and say, hey, you are invited to come to my kingdom, to come and take partake of the feast. It says they were invited the good and the bad. And we need to realize that that's in the servant's perspective. These servants are told, go out and give out the invitation to anyone you come across. So they give to some people who, in their eyes, appear to be pretty good, and other people who, in their eyes, they're saying, should I be inviting this person? They're not exactly good. And yet, in the king's eyes, all of them equally unworthy, because he didn't originally send the message to them. All of them equally unworthy because, in his eyes, they're bad. They're sinful. And that's where we find ourselves. Recipients of this invitation. Unworthy recipients of this invitation. Now take note about just how absurd this entire scenario is. You have a king, he wants to fill his his wedding hall with guests, so he sends it out to the streets to get the homeless people, poor people, tax collectors, prostitutes, every single type of person that you could possibly gather together and find on the streets, and bring them together to fill his hall for his son, the prince. That just wouldn't really happen. If you've ever been married or had to plan a reception, you know just how hard it is to figure out the guest list. You pour over names for hours. You decide you have too many names. You need to cut some people, but you already have the amount of people that you want, the exact right list, and you have to make some hard cuts. There's never room for people you don't know, or people that you aren't friends with. And yet, that's exactly who the king is inviting. This king goes out and finds all manner of people that are foreign to him, sinful people, the worst type of filth that no one would want in their homes, much less their wedding hall, and he invites them. That's exactly what the Lord does for each one of us. The worst type of filth. People who were born in sin and doomed to die. People who were enslaved to sin. Yet the Lord says, invite them to my kingdom. Come to my wedding feast. And that would be a pretty good spot to stop the parable. The Lord inviting those who are unworthy like us into his wedding hall But he goes on from there. It takes quite a turn here in verse 11. When the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called but few are chosen. At first appearance, this is pretty shocking behavior on the part of this king. He sees a man who's come in there from the streets, and he sees he's not wearing a suitable robe, and he binds him and throws him out. That's pretty cruel behavior. What if the man was poor and couldn't afford a wedding garment? What if the man didn't have any time, and he had to come a long way, so he didn't have any time to change, and he just came in the clothes he was wearing? And yet the master ties him up and throws him out. That might be the, your first thought as you're reading this, is how cruel this king can be. Except for your perspective will change when you know that in those days, the king, he's throwing the best feast for his people, for his son, and so he needed the people to be wearing the best. And what he would do he was he would actually provide the garments for the people to wear. And you can see this obviously to be the case because he's invited all these manner of people from the streets and every single one of them wearing a wedding garment except for this one man. And when he accuses him of not having worn the garment that he was wearing, the man doesn't say, I'm too poor to afford one or I couldn't go home to get it. The man doesn't have an excuse because there was none. The garment was provided and the man refused. 
And so the Lord, or the king, binds him up and throws him outside. The Lord invites us to his wedding feast. Will he find us unsuitable? Will he see that what we're wearing is not good enough? Will he bind us up and throw us out? Well, if we were to approach the Lord by our own virtues, or to approach the Lord in heaven and say to him, Lord, I'm a good person. That's why you should let me into heaven. Well, that's approaching the Lord with your own clothes. And what you're doing is you're either overestimating your own goodness, or you're underestimating the perfection which the Lord demands. And it just won't be good enough. So how can we possibly stand in the Lord's wedding hall? How can we possibly stand before the Lord when we know exactly what we are? Thankfully, the king, the Lord, provides the wedding garments. He provided the garments of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. He washed us in his blood on Calvary and cleansed us from all of our sins. He made us wear the spotless robes of his righteousness so that before the Lord, we do belong in spite of all those sins that threaten to keep us away from him. Yes, we find that in Jesus, we are worthy wedding guests. Now, I want to go back to that first question I asked you. Hopefully you've come to the right answer by now. If you're standing before the Lord on Judgment Day, and God looks at you and he says, why should I let you into heaven? What's your answer? What would you point to? If you could point to one thing above everything else, what would it be? For many in this world, the answer goes something like this. Oh, Lord, you should let me in because I'm a good person. Or it's, Lord, you should let me in because even though I know I sin, I still try my best and I give, give of myself to people and I volunteer my time. Or the answer might be something like, Lord, I go to church every Sunday. I've served you my entire life. What do you think about those answers? That's, I, believe in you. I believe in you. Absolutely correct. If we come to him with these answers, that's like coming with our own clothes and expecting that to be good enough. But rather, when the Lord says, why should I let you into heaven? Say, Lord, you should let me into heaven because of what you've done. Because you extended the invitation to me. Because you gave me the correct robes to wear. Because you died and took away my sins. Because you have washed me and cleansed me. Lord, because of what you've done, I deserve heaven. I believe in you. Now, we won't have to answer that question on Judgment Day. But it is a good illustration for us to keep in mind. Yes, we have been invited to the wedding feast. Who wouldn't want to go to that feast? And the Lord makes us worthy solely because of what he has done for us. Thanks be to God for this glorious invitation. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Thank you.